Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Welcome to a special edition of Due Process, a look back at nearly a decade and a half of law and justice on this air, a tenure recently honored with the New Jersey Network Legacy Award. So later in this program, we'll trace the evolution of three major justice stories that we followed since our premiere season 14 years ago. But first, we share with you a piece I prepared with the help of editor Rich Kretschmer, an overview of where we've been in these 14 years and where we're going. Due process, 14 seasons, 14 Emmys. Joined us on a journey behind the badge, behind the bar, even the bench. I'm Ray Brown, and what we've tried to bring you is an inside look at our legal system through the eyes of a longtime criminal defense lawyer, that's me, and a longtime reporter on social and legal justice. That's our senior producer, Sandra King. And since today we wrap our first due process season, we thought we'd look back at where we've been. And since then, there have been countless other stories and people. Freedom. Yes. Freedom. Still, our mission hasn't changed. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. And what a year it's been for legal and social justice, from gay rights to guns, from FBI guidelines to Guantanamo. The stories that might not otherwise be told. The important issues. Call well, your next witness. The essential facts. The familiar and the not so familiar faces. Nearly a decade of serious talk. We have the responsibility not only to punish those who committed the attack, but more important to prevent future attacks. Serious stories. This is the execution chamber. Serious people. New issues come before courts that perhaps we wouldn't even have thought of a decade ago. Let's stop talking about, about enforcement policies that don't work, and let's start talking about what we really do about the drug problem. George Will, after the trial, said Johnny Cochran's a great lawyer and a bad citizen. You hear the lawyer jokes, the lawyer bashing, but this is good stuff. I don't believe that the safe haven law and what Mary is espousing are mutually exclusive. To show you how politics works, and then I'm going to sit down, because I don't want to shock you too much. I'm just being mild with you tonight. For every seven people executed in this country, there is one person taken off death row on the grounds of new evidence of innocence. And then there were the stories. Real people confronting real questions of law and justice. My father has been in prison and my mother is in prison now, but I have nothing to be ashamed of. The janitor who spent 13 years behind bars until DNA finally freed him. I think they wanted somebody and they found somebody. The eight-year-olds arrested in the name of zero tolerance. Did you tell the class I'm going to kill all of you? No. The American citizen thrown off a flight because a fellow passenger thought he looked suspicious. It's just really based upon my physical appearance. I fit a profile. The mother on crusade in the wake of Megan's murder. America in crisis. On the battlefield. Johnson kept telling me that it was my job to find a way out of Vietnam. And at home. The war on drugs. It's more than quadrupled our prison population. One in 100 American men and women behind bars. The shameful memories. About my 40 acres and my mule. The hopeful tomorrow. The future is now. The future is north. And we've brought the public into criminal court. You purposely and knowingly caused the death 
of Irving Flats. Drug court? I told you, you're on trial every day, sir. Truancy uh, court? Your child, Jose, was out 47 days. Small no. claims court? It's just one, it's one, it's one, it's one. We've looked at crime and punishment, at justice and injustice. I think all the time my destiny was to survive. We've looked at problems facing lawyers. People don't understand how you could represent somebody who may turn out to be guilty or who you may even suspect or believe is guilty. About those who would be lawyers. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Fatima Jafik, and I represent Will Smith, the petitioner. But whether it's a question of medicinal marijuana, affirmative action, wine seeking, or the future of the pledge. Due process makes the complex comprehensible. And it's just the beginning of law and justice stories that need to be told. Just the beginning of a shared commitment to the highest standard of journalism. Never forgetting that our focus is justice. There have been so many justice stories we've covered over these 14 years, but for the rest of this half hour, we're going to focus on just three that we've followed for the life of this show. Three stories of enormous social and legal import, all of them indicative that attitudes change and so does the law. And so we start with the subject of innocence among the imprisoned, an idea that was practically unheard of 14 years ago when DNA exonerations were just beginning. We began our first season with one such story. Okay, we got somebody. We need somebody, we got somebody. David Shepard, at first glance, would seem a kind of ordinary guy. He's a maintenance man at Newark City Hall. He's a father and a football coach. But there is nothing ordinary about his story. David Shepard spent more than 11 years in state prison, virtually his entire adult life, for a rape that he did not commit. He was without any record. He was a hardworking guy. He had a, just a newborn baby. He'd never been in any trouble. Presented an alibi to the jury. It was corroborated by a number of people. And, uh, uh, and he got convicted. Convicted and sentenced to 30 years in state prison. And David Shepard would still be behind bars if he hadn't spent so much time in the prison library. I had read about a guy in California, how DNA had helped him get released from prison. And you thought maybe me? So yeah, and that's when it dawned on me. How long ago was that? That was eight years ago. Eight years for David Shepard, from request to result to freedom. Eight years from the time he asked for his first DNA test. I'd like to report that that's all changed, that the system has opened up and that there is post-conviction relief for anybody who says DNA could clear them, but I don't think that's so. No, it needs to be more than that. First of all, we keep in mind that the burden is on the convicted person. That person has to show that there's DNA available, and not just DNA in the case, but DNA which, if the test results are correct, excludes the possibility that that person was effectively the perpetrator or at least requires a new trial. Uh, all of that is complicated by the fact that they need effective assistance of counsel to put that together, labs available, and it is dependent to some extent on whether the prosecutor cooperates, is adamantly opposed. So there are a lot of variables, and by no means can we take it for granted that anybody who says DNA was involved in my case gets close to exoneration. And of course, it's not just in New Jersey. We saw recently a case in Florida of somebody who spent 35 years in prison for the rape and kidnap of a nine-year-old boy. Turns out he asks for DNA. It takes him years and years and years. Finally, the testing is done. A judge finally says yes, and guess what? He didn't do it. An interesting case in New Jersey in 2007, a man named Byron Halls, he released after 18 years service for two murders a that case he did you not worked. convict. I was involved, and I was co-counsel to the Innocence Project, Barry Sheck's organization that had also worked with David Shepard. And this was a case in which, uh, interestingly enough, when they said to Byron, when he finally got it after 18 years, what do you want most? He said, a bath. 
death. But this is a guy who had struggled for a long time. There had been DNA in the case, and it was a long time from his first asking for help, learning about the Innocence Project, and getting that process going forward, even going so far in that case as to identify from the DNA the actual perpetrator of the offense. There have been nearly 250 cases of innocence proven by DNA, and most of them by our friend Barry and, and the Innocence Project in New York, although there are now Innocence Projects set up all over the country. Surely it's a wonderful thing for those 250 people, but I think something even more important has happened, Raymond, and that is that the general public's belief that anyone who's convicted was in fact guilty, and if they say they're innocent, don't take it seriously. I think that's been challenged by all of these DNA cases and really opened up a whole new look at the criminal justice system. Well, and it's a complicated belief system because you have to believe, as I suspect most Americans do, that all things considered, we have the fairest justice system in the world, the place where you're most likely to get a fair trial. On the other hand, that despite what we regard as the foundational virtues of our system, an innocent person can be convicted and it's hard to have recourse and this opens up the general public people who have to serve as jurors who have to pay ultimately for a system that will tolerate these subsequent proceedings uh, and awareness that the system can and does make errors speaking of uh, of payment uh, we saw when David Shepard came out of prison that there was no restitution available in New Jersey he gives us credit for uh, the law having been changed in New Jersey now twenty thousand dollars for each year that you were wrongfully imprisoned. Now, Senator Cody has introduced a bill that would raise that to 50000 Interestingly enough, the case that he says made him do that was Byron Halsey's case, the case of the young man I just told you about. Um, we'll have to see. I think Florida has a $50,000 limit. Other states are looking at this because it's awfully hard to value the incredible loss a person sustains to their life, to their ability to survive. Yet another issue, in addition to the public recognition of this, is the system's recognition of this. Because once a person is exonerated, the question is, how did he get there? So if he was a person convicted also because of a confession? What does that say about our belief that he wouldn't say it if he hadn't done it? Or identifications, which are also something we tend to believe the person who says, I know that man, I'll remember him forever, but it turns out those are not always so reliable. Raymond, and it is that idea that someone tried and convicted in a court of law could actually be innocent. That fueled the changes we've seen in another of those stories we've returned to again and again, like when the execution in Texas of Carla Faye Tucker caught the attention of an entire country. Anger and um, violence that was in me was just, at, it was just removed at that point. It was like God just took it out of me. Her apparent conversion was not enough to keep Carla Faye Tucker from execution, but it may have won some new opposition to capital punishment. Today we're going to have special prayer again for Carla. It also focused new national attention on how long it can take from the time the crime is done until the death sentence is finally served. The grisly discovery was made shortly after 7 this morning. In Tucker's case, that meant from her two pickaxe murders in 1983 until her death by lethal injection 15 years later. Why in the world should a fair trial and appropriate appeals take 10 or 12 or 15 or 18 years? With a death penalty back on the book since 82, more than 50 people sentenced to die and still no execution. The governor's appointed a special commission charged with finding ways to speed up the process. But despite that call for quick and lethal retribution, things went a drastically different way when a later commission came up with a different call to abolish capital punishment in New Jersey. And the call was heard, the legislature passed it, there is no more death penalty in New Jersey. Of course, let's put that in context. There had been no execution here since the early 60s, despite the fact that we'd had a capital punishment law on the books for most of the period and between people then on and death now. row. And always people on death row, and there for 10, 15, 18 years. And prosecutors justifiably believed that the legislature had said, this is a tool you could use. So sooner or later, this issue had to be confronted directly. It was a controversial one. Maybe the most thorny part of it is that there's an issue called retribution that isn't subject to proof. It's about people's moral views about what's in balance, and that's always a difficult one to resolve. But there were other issues that could be tackled, like the cost, 
uh, like this complex jurisprudence called proportionality, where you try to compare one person to another and see if we are really executing the worst of the worst, sometimes by a very complicated mathematical formula. So there were lots of issues on the side of abolition and the notion that maybe life without parole is a viable alternative. And life without parole is what we wound up with. Um, seem to be a victory for those who um, feel that justice is not always what it needs to be here in New Jersey. And yet, there was always the reminder that are you going to cause more harm to more people because by virtue of not having capital punishment, more people will get life without parole who perhaps would have gotten 15, 25, 30 years. And now, essentially, their lives are finished. Well, there were always abolitionists who were concerned that the trade they were making was a devil's bargain, that effectively there would be more people who would be sentenced to effectively lose their lives in prison, although it wouldn't be in an execution chamber. Um, we'll have to see how that unfolds. It was a complex debate, and those people who favored capital punishment fa felt they gave up a lot when they gave up this ultimately most traumatic and important form of punishment. And what do you see in terms of life without parole increasing geometrically? I think there's a possibility of it, maybe even a likelihood of it, because what we know is that there will be jurors who would be reluctant to take someone's life, but quite willing to lock them away forever. On the other hand, it's too early to tell until we have a greater statistical measure by looking at cases that would have been charged as a capital case and seeing how they wound up. We do know, Raymond, though, that New Jersey was not alone in this move from being... Um, at least having capital punishment on the books, to uh, a far different view, based in part on this idea that perhaps you could be sending an innocent person to his or her death. New Mexico uh, recently became the 15th state to repeal the death penalty, and even Texas, where we saw Carla Faye Tucker lose her life, uh, which had been the symbol of capital punishment in huge numbers, particularly when uh, George Bush was governor, we've seen an enormous drop, 34 death sentences in the 1990s on an average year, nine this year. It's hard not to see both innocence and cost because this length of time that we've been talking about that it takes for a person to run the legal course to get to the point of execution is an extraordinarily costly process. And while you can talk about truncating or shortening it, ultimately either you give a person justice or you don't. And if that justice is tremendously expensive, again, in a society where we're more and more cost conscious even about justice issues, that cost coupled with lingering doubt about whether we might execute an innocent person, it was inevitable perhaps that we would come to a different balance on capital punishment, though I'm not sure that the discussion is over by any means. Definitely not over, and yet there definitely has been a liberalization in attitudes toward the idea of getting rid of the death penalty. On the other hand, there's something else that's been happening, and it happened in 2001. Well, the war on terror uh, has opened the door to not just mass murders in the sense of some guy maybe killing 30 or 40 people, but killings of thousands of people like 9-11. And the war on terror has spawned a whole set of debates about Guantanamo and detention. Uh, interestingly enough... And capital punishment. But, the guys who are going to be charged in New York are being charged in a capital case. But it's interesting the, that... The government that, wants... That, that much of the debate, however, uh, even on the part of people who are opposed to the government's position, hasn't focused on the death penalty issue yet. By and large, it's been what kind of trials will they be, where will they be, will they get a fair trial? But we're coming there, Raymond, and if we saw a sea change in public attitude and public policy on capital punishment, it wasn't nearly as great as the changes we saw on another controversial issue. Another that we've covered since the start of due process, when most of New Jersey found the notion of gay marriage to be virtually unthinkable. And when a Rutgers professor sued the state because his life partner had been denied his health benefits. If I had received the health benefits in 92 when we first requested it, uh, I feel strongly that Steve would still be alive today. I don't really have much doubt about that. Steve was Bill Mayo's longtime companion, his domestic partner for 18 years. He died of AIDS four years ago. And Mayo, a professor of ceramic engineering, insists that Rutgers may be to blame. There were, he claims, doctors and drugs and treatments that Steve was forced to pass up. Shortly after he died, I uh, ultimately lost my house in addition to uh, using all the cash that we had. 
So Bill so Mayo is an enthusiastic plaintiff question. in a suit designed to extend That's health right. benefits but to the partners of other Rutgers faculty and staff, a suit that so far has failed. The word spouse is set forth in the statute enabling the state health benefits program to function. The fact is they're not identical to a spousal relationship. And there is... Um, Just because there was no ceremony. That's correct. So before the appellate court back then, and in the legislature now, it has always been about the ceremony, the wedding. Even after New Jersey passed a civil union law that was designed to extend all rights and privileges of marriage while calling it something else. Well, because our state Supreme Court had said, you can call it something else. Uh, we remember that uh, Deborah Poritz was the chief justice at that time. And she said, no, that, that, that's not right. We need to allow this thing to be called marriage for gay people just as it is for straight people. The rest of the court wasn't willing to go that far. I said the legislature had an out and the legislature took that out. You know, I think, I hope a person could be forgiven for feeling we're going in circles on this issue. I mean, if you go back to the beginning when we first started due process 14 years ago, uh, this was not a subject that was necessarily in the mainstream of discussion, but it was starting to percolate. And there was a sense that civil union might be a way that we could attack the problem and not have a massive attack from people who felt opposed to relationship between people of the same gender. And all of that changed. When did that change? Well, if you, if you remember, when we did our early shows on this subject, there was hysteria on the part of people who opposed any sort of legal recognition of gay unions whatsoever. Now those same people in fighting gay marriage are saying, well, we've got civil unions, that's okay. But there's a point at which even that has begun to shift, and many of the folks who initially fought any kind of union then sort of moved in the direction of embracing it have now drawn another line in the sand, not just in New Jersey, but around the country on the question of marriage. I can't help but thinking some of that is religiously or morally based. That is, people saying, um, I'm not opposed to civil rights, but there's something else going on here, and that that complicates the conversation. Well, we're certainly seeing that in New Jersey where the, the, the lobby against um, gay marriage is coming very strongly from religious organizations and particularly from the Catholic Church. But I think we need to consider how far we've come when the debate is between civil unions or gay marriage. Go back to when we began this program and it was difficult to get anybody who wasn't personally invested to even think about gay rights as a serious problem in America. I think we've gone way past that. I'm glad you said America because while our tendency is to be caught up in the question of, for example, what's the legislature going to do now? Are they going to pull back because of pressure or because the governor is opposed? That this mirrors a larger struggle throughout the country. Uh, the last presidential election saw uh, a proposition uh, that really would have, that really set back the cause of moving in the direction of gay marriage. So it's not just here in New Jersey, although in New Jersey, the question would be what happens if the legislature won't pass an act granting gay marriage or if it's vetoed by the governor. So that's my, that's my question to you. We have a governor coming in who is very directly opposed to the idea of gay marriage. Uh, not likely that we're going to get a bill unless it happens to come out of um, the, as we tape, the, the lame duck session that has another couple of weeks to go. So let me ask you, is there then going to be yet another state Supreme Court case because the court said you can only call it something else if you've got full rights, privileges, responsibilities. Well, procedurally, it's hard to see how the court could duck this. I mean, it's been involved in this from the beginning. You had the chief justice in a vigorous dissent not so long ago saying we need gay marriage. And you have arguably the legislature ignoring the mandate laid down to it by the court. How can the court duck the issue? And it's in these areas where perhaps there's a sense that the legislative branch won't meet the challenge that courts have intervened and maybe that's where this court will right now. Well, you know, we see the rest of the country, Raymond, um, going in many different directions on this. You've got some states passing gay marriage and others repealing it. That's true. Um, and the interesting question is, is this a situation like Brown? or like in our state, issues concerning housing, where the court says, we see an instance where we think we know what the legislature wants to do, but doesn't have the political heart to do it. We're gonna do it for them. And, and with that, Raymond, we are out of time and at the end of yet another due process season. But we'll be back for more cutting edge issues of law and justice next week. 
and every week. And we hope you'll be here too. Till then, for Sandy and all of us here, Henrietta Parker, Laurel Spira, Christine Ekman, Pat Scanella, John Jorgensen, Richard Kretschmer, Mary Kate Maloney, and all the NJN people who have helped us get on the air each week for the last 14 years and going forward. I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching and stay with us. problems facing lawyers. People don't understand how you could represent somebody who may turn out to be guilty or who you may even suspect or believe is guilty. About those who would be lawyers. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Fatima Jafik and I represent Will Smith, the petitioner. But whether it's a question of medicinal marijuana, affirmative action, wine seeking, or the future of the pledge. Due process makes the complex comprehensible. And it's just the beginning of law and justice stories that need to be told. Just the beginning of a shared commitment to the highest standard of journalism. Never forgetting that our focus is justice. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy.